I'm so fascinated by Sweden as a lot of people are. In fact, it uh, in an unlikely coup, it's kind of gone to the top of my list other than maybe Vienna if I can actually get in for 200 bucks yeah. uh, with with a test. It might be the cheapest way for me to get a test. I mean, have you yeah. tried looking for tests in Austin? Not really. Have you? No, no, not really. Me, me neither. Me neither. I don't know. They said that they were going to be available by drive through at Walgreens or some shit, but the tests are so inaccurate. It's not like I don't want to get it because I would want to like contribute to the data pool. Cause even if like one in five of them were inaccurate, you could build that into the data set of like thousands of people tested and then get some accurate in get, get an accurate sense of how widespread it is and how communicable it is. And then maybe base some sound policy of it uh, yeah. off of it. But all of that is contingent on people making sound policy out of <laughs> collected data. And I don't know if I trust any of the people in charge right now to do that. They're kind of just lining up on opposite partisan lines like they always do. So yeah. maybe I don't want to bother getting <laughs> getting tested unless I get an antibody test for my if it's inaccurate. Like it's just impossible to tell whether you yourself are yeah. infected. And that's not, and that's even the case with the test you would get in Vienna if that is a thing, because they're allowing for the fact that some people will get in. But if the test is accurate enough, then they can make a screen that at least catches some of the positive cases trying to get in and they limit the spread. But it's amazing when there's a pandemic how it's so much less about any individual person, any individual vector than it is about the spread through the entire population. Mm -hmm. And Americans, maybe they're, they're pretty individualist and they tend to think about me and my family. I don't know if that's the same in the Middle East, but... Yeah, but there's more of a social togetherness, if that makes sense, at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. What about in Palestine? Oh, it's even more. <laughs> but in terms of COVID oh, response, of COVID, oh, it's really actually, which is weird. Uh, you know, there's Israel and and there's Palestine. In Palestine, there I isn't heard. many cases, but in in Israel, there's a lot of cases, and the reports on death numbers uh, are showing really a low percentage, which doesn't make sense, doesn't add up. A low percentage of in, infections, uh, in, of death cases? Com death, death compared to uh, uh, like active cases or... Are they mass testing? I mean, the death rate <sighs> may be a lot lower than we think just because in a big country like the United States, for example, where there's been the most recorded cases, the testing situation is also terrible. It's hard to get a test. And so mm -hmm. we can't really even know what percentage of infected cases are dying because we won't know <laughs> about a lot of the cases until we do antibody tests and find out who did have it and we didn't even know it. I don't know, man. But Israel's a much smaller population and I think they're, they, they might have a better capacity to test their population than we do. Yeah. So maybe they know more than we do. Yeah. That's a thing. I think they also have, do they also have more like in migration than Palestine does? Uh, the West yeah, Bank. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean Pal Pal Palestinians cannot do anything. Like they're basically in a big prison. And I mean, Israel controls everything. And, and it's weird actually that Israel is not trying to spread it in between the Palestinians because that's what, what, you would, what you, you would think of. Why? Because uh, it's been the case, man. It's been the case. It's just like uh, hate on hate on hate on trying to confiscate lands, on trying to... It's really bad, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't mean to sound naive, but I don't kind of live my day to day in yeah. the Israel in the Israel Palestine conflict. So uh, anything you have to say is a more on the ground, informed opinion than mine. Yeah, potentially. Uh, it's uh, it's a never-ending story, man. It's it started in 1948, followed it by 1967. There was peace negotiations in in 1993, 1994, and after that negotiations, the idea was to have uh, Israel as a state uh, in like whatever they had in 1948, and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip is considered Palestine. But even after that. Until this day, they are still confiscating more lands of the West Bank. Uh, they are still confiscating more houses, uh, kicking people out. And 
just keeps under what doing. pretext um just like uh, oh you don't have a permit or whatever it's, it's just it's occupation that's what they do and by un resolutions if anybody believe out there believes in the un resolutions or anything um by UN re- resolutions, all these uh, confiscations and land taking is illegal. Like every settlement in the West Bank, uh, the West Bank is illegal by UN resolutions and by common sense. Um, that being said, if you are actually as as a Palestinian, if you consider it as yeah, that's Palestine, West Bank and Gaza Strip. To us, Palestine is from like the red, uh, the what not the red. What, what do you call it? The Jordan River, all the way to the Mediter- Mediterranean, from the Golan in the north to uh, the Red Sea, Port Ila in the south. But I mean, now is the case. 1948 happened. They took the land. It became Israel, whatever. There should be another solution. Now, speaking about traveling, um, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm someone who's Palestinian who was born in Jerusalem. And right now, I cannot enter Jerusalem. I try to travel to uh, Palestine and I, I can enter the West Bank. I have what you call or what we call a, a green ID, which is a Palestinian ID. It allows you to go to the West Bank and that's it. If you want to go to any part of the Israeli, the occupied lands, I call it. I don't call it Israel because anyway, um, you have to have a special permit and not necessarily you're going to have it. So I was born in, Pal- in uh, Jerusalem and I cannot go to Jerusalem. I had a, an American citizen uh, traveling with me to the West Bank from Jordan through the border and they denied her entry and they took her passport and she had to call her uh, the US embassy in Jordan to tell them to uh, like give me my passport if you're going to deny me entry why are you withholding my passport which why, sounds why, crazy wait, was this uh, was this Israeli authorities or Israeli Palestinian authorities, authorities Israeli authorities they they if you if they feel that you have any compassion with the Palestinian people. What were they even doing there on the Jordanian border? They, uh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like they control everything. Like if you want to travel, so, so they uh, patrol the borders with the permission yeah. of the Jordanians. Yeah. So um, here, here, here's the situation. If you want to go to Palestine, uh, as let's say uh, a Palestinian, or uh, yeah, as a Palestinian, if you want to go to Palestine, we don't have an airport. You're gonna have. I was to gonna go, ask about that. Yes, you're gonna have to go through Jordan. Through Jordan, there is like a bridge. You go on that bridge. You go through the Jordanian border. Then there's the Israeli border. Then there's the Palestinian border. So the Palestinian border is just like formalities in my head. Like I don't care about that authority because it's it's bullshit. Like there's, yeah, that it's 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 bullshit. It's uh, yeah, basically like. To sum it all up, man, I'm stuck on the fact of there not being an airport. Yeah, that's uh, that that's weird. That's weird to think about. Yeah, and here's a fun. Know, a, lot of things, a, f- a lot of things are weird to think about. I mean, it's weird to me. Although I'm not going to complain about it too much, but it's weird to me that there are places in the world that I'm not allowed to go, which is maybe a very entitled American thing yeah. to say. But the fact that I can't go to Mecca or Medina, not that I'm in any rush, is just like well. Why not? Yeah. I mean, Why the fuck yeah. not? And you can explain the reasoning to me and it's not my decision to make, but it's just like, or if I were to be convicted of a felony and then no longer be allowed into Canada, for example, which yeah. is a thing. Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's so stupid, man. Like it, it doesn't make any sense. I have a cousin who's American and she's a reporter and she was born and raised in California. And every time she, cause her, her dad is Palestinian and he has that green ID uh, every time she wants to go to Palestine, even to Israel, she has to go through the border. Like she cannot travel to the Israeli airport. So imagine, like you be having to do that. Like you wanna, you wanna go to Israel. You wanna go to the parts of uh, Israel. You have to go to Jordan first, then cross the the river, like by land, to go to that part. Like it, it's it's like a bus or a truck. Yeah, like a bus, basically. If if you're too fancy, you can take a private car. With you, you pay extra money, but it goes. How long a ride from Amman? It's uh, if you want to take a one shot ride, it's two hours. Like you're you're in the middle of Jerusalem from Amman to Jerusalem, mm-hmm. but with the border with all that shit, it's just <laughs> good luck. And like if if you decide to go, for example, if you decide to fly in, no problem. Yeah, as you yourself. But if you decide to go to Jordan, then go through the land to to Palestine or to enter Israel again. Good luck. They're yeah. gonna check your social media. They're gonna. The Israeli authorities. Yeah. 
Man, I th- I've thought a little bit about going to Jordan. I mean, everyone wants a photo op in Petra, and uh, I don't know much about Amman. Uh, I've kind of wanted to go to Lebanon, um, just thinking about the Middle East. There have been times when I've wanted to go to Israel and Jerusalem and maybe Tel Aviv. None of it's been super high on the list. I'm pretty focused on uh, Europe, Africa, and South America, but... If you it's love food, you should go, man. Yeah. Oh my god. To where? Jordan. Yeah. Lebanon and parts of Palestine. Like it depends on what. what, what For an American, Palestine yeah. feels a little intimidating. Um, I don't know if I'm right to think about that. It sounds like your friend got a passport confiscated, and it doesn't even. It doesn't even sound like it was necessarily the Palestinian Authority's fault. It was the Israelis authorities yeah, yeah. way of doing things and like, why do you want to go here? But, um, but there's, there's a lot of people that actually like Americans who move to Palestine cause they love it a lot. And there's a, like, there's a very it? hip What's culture. There? There's a very hip culture in Ramallah. Cause I have no idea. Yeah. So Ramallah is basically this really hipsters town with people smoking weed with partying and, you know, house parties and, it's just a crazy town, and uh, it's really nice. Like, uh, I know a lot of people who are American who love Jordan and Palestine, and they just like love it. I, I met a lot of people in 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 Palestine uh, from America, and we are still friends until this day. Is it just the luck of the draw if you get harassed at the border? Trying uh, to cross I mean, from Jordan yeah, it, it depends on your West Bank. A, your activity. It depends on what you are. Like, if you are. Because th- that girl was a Muslim and she was wearing a hijab, so oh. they kind of picked up on her. And she's American, but I mean, whatever. Uh, racism is there. Mm-hmm. Um, if you show activity, like like you're you're a- active about Palestinian cause and whatnot, like there's an, a, a Jewish person who's from Sweden who uh, had an initiative called Walk to Palestine. He walked from Sweden to Palestine. And after months and months of walking, when he made it to the border, they denied him entry. And it was expected because because <laughs> he, he was uh, an activist and they, they do not want any ac- activism happening in there. Man, I knew being an apathetic douche would pay off for me at some point. <laughs> it was just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Ramallah sounds kind of cool. It is. Ramallah is cool. Yeah. Ramallah sounds cool. Beirut sounds cool. I'm I, I'm sorry to be stuck on this, but why doesn't Ramallah have an airport? Is there a no fly zone? It's, it's again, it's occupation. They they do not want to give that access to Palestinians. Hmm. Simple as that. But uh, Beirut is oof. Beirut is a city if you want to like party and enjoy food and, and Beirut has it all. I want to say yeah, a yeah. lot of Americans. Beirut isn't high on their on their list. Although I feel like that might be changing a little bit as they. I mean, people now it's, talk it's about it. I mean, Anthony it. Bourdain did a lot t- to open people's eyes about that. One of his first parts unknowns, I think, was in Beirut, and a war broke out while he was there. And yeah, he was stuck that, in the I was hotel. about to say, there's a lot of that. That's kind of, it's it's a murky area. Like I can I cannot tell you that it's safe mm-hmm. or not. Well, I mean, that goes back to what we were saying about COVID-19, which is that Americans have this, I don't know if it's common in other parts of the world that you've been in. I feel like Americans have kind of a unique sense of my life matters and you know what i do is important and here i am fucking recording my conversations with people as if you know anyone's gonna listen putting out youtube videos but uh (laughs) uh, so i'm definitely part of that but i i really don't like the idea of stay safe being the watchword of the covid crisis in america because it's it leads nowhere. It's a road to nowhere. It's a road to us being stuck in our apartments for the next year and a half. Whereas, you know, it's more to me about accepting risk and the fact that because I'm young and pretty healthy, the risk for me is pretty low. I mean, I don't know what to say to people who are more elderly. I'll help as much as I can, but, uh, you know, there's trade-offs that go along with it. People who are elderly and have autoimmune diseases live with more risk no matter what they do. And it really sucks that this whole process that we're going through has increased the risk for them so much. It's increased the risk for us a little bit, probably to the point where it's tolerable, to the point where we say, you know, we drive cars, we could get into car crashes. 
maybe we're approaching that level of risk for people who are particularly young and healthy. It's, of course, a lot higher yeah. than, but I can't even think of the last time I saw an elderly person. And I know my friends who have autoimmune conditions that we're all kind of staying away from each other and they're kind of hunkering down with their husbands and wives and waiting for it to be over. But even some of them are talking about coming out of the woodwork. I think that I was talking to my friends about maybe crisis fatigue setting in and us kind of like reaching a breaking point and being like, you know what? Fuck it. We're tired of this and we're going out and we're accepting the risk. Almost like going through stages of grief where you come to accept this. I hate the phrase new normal. I fucking hate it so badly, but I would be happy with new normal if new normal was acceptance of risk and us living lives like humans because people are going to start tracking mental illness and cases of suicide and effects of economic depression and there's every reason to believe that it could get bad the same reason as there's every reason to believe that COVID-19 could and in fact has gotten bad true it's going to be an interesting era oh for fuck's sake yeah right that Chinese that, that Chinese curse may you live in interesting times that's racist. You don't say that. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It might not have been Chinese. It might have been from somewhere else. <laughs> I'm kidding. Nothing is from China. Literally nothing. nothing. Definitely not these microphones. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. So, anyways, I have most of my flights on award travel, so they're easy enough to, to be postponed. So... Uh, I'm in a pretty good position with all the frequent flyer miles I have, except I can't fucking use them, but I keep on postponing it about that. So how, how do you, how do you do that? Like, so you spend X amount of money, you get thousands of miles or points. How, how do you, how do you make it where it is better than actual cashback to use that cashback to travel? There's different tricks. Um, it especially is the case if you use it for, um, business class and first class, which is a much more comfortable and delightful flight, uh, assuming that there's actual meal service and you don't have to wear a mask, which might not be the case for a while. But whereas, for example, a business class seat might cost five times as much money, it only costs twice as much miles. So there's outsized value there. But even if you don't want to, um, spend a lot of, uh, spend the extra miles on business class and first class, if your goal is to just make the miles last a long time, there's a couple of things you can do. For example, United Miles will take you to, um, there's something that United does called the excursionist perk, where if you fly from one zone to another, say the US to Europe, let's say you fly from Austin to uh, Paris, then if you fly a middle leg, in that trip, let's say to Athens, as long as it's in the same zone, Athens and Paris are still in the European zone, and then you fly back to the United States, back to Austin, that middle leg will cost you no extra miles. It's just a perk. They just throw in an extra an extra flight for no miles. And it depends on how you feel about that because low-cost carriers can get you there for like 20 to 80 bucks. So it might not matter that it costs no miles in some circumstances, but if you check luggage, then flying on a major character like United could be a very big deal. Uh, Also there's interesting tricks. Like for example, um, the United's chart considers the Galapagos islands part of Northern South America, which is actually a very long and expensive flight to take, but you can catch an Avianca flight from uh, Quito, Ecuador to the Galapagos islands and pay nothing except for the taxes. If you use the excursionist perk. So there's fun ways to do that. Another weirdness is that KLM air France considers Israel to be part of Europe on their chart. Mm -hmm. So most, most airline frequent flyer mile programs will place Israel in the Middle East and charge for awards that way. But uh, KLM Air, Air France flying blue charges as if it's part of Europe. So that's a way to save if you're coming from the U.S. to Israel. Um, Air, Air France KLM also does promo awards between the U.S. and Europe. Uh, they don't have one out of Austin yet, but they have a hub at Houston. And so once a month, they'll publish awards. And pretty frequently, Houston is available and you can redeem awards for 25% less miles or 50% less miles if you 
book within a certain time frame. And also, if you get transferable points like American Express, Chase, or uh, Capital One points that transferred to Air France, sometimes they have bonuses. So the way I got my super cheap redemption to Lisbon was that I used a promo award that was 50% off the miles between Houston and Europe. And then I transferred the miles at a 50% bonus. So essentially I paid one third of the miles that I would have otherwise. So it's getting tougher. They're trying to make it so that one point is worth is the say is worth one penny and at that point you might as well have cash back but if you know a few tricks then you can start using miles to do some crazy shit nice yeah <laughs>